it's me again, Emma. I've got cystic fibrosis, which is a genetic lung disorder. Basically, uh, the mucus ducts in my system produce excess mucus, which clogs my lungs and other organs, making it difficult to breathe, digest food and stuff like that. Um, so it's, it's an incurable disorder, basically. I do like, though, forget-me-nots, because of the little sentiment and they're just so cute and I probably have them as, like, wedding flowers. Not that I'm getting married or anything. I'm not, I'm not getting married. Um, but yeah, if I was, yeah, I'm just going to stop. Right. <laughs>
and I obviously pass with flying colours, um, she uh, said, right, well, I think we've got a pair of lungs for you. At which point I was like, oh my God, um, and <clears throat> shouted, my mum, mum, it's my call. My brother, who was like, in bed as well he like leapt out of bed and he comes onto the landing and was like oh my god is it your call and we were like yeah it's the call um, and <clears throat> my coordinator on the phone said oh holly calm down a bit she said um i'm gonna order an ambulance for you now it's gonna be with you within 20 minutes and we'd actually had to ring my dad as well at work so he made his way home because um i'm only allowed one person in the ambulance with me and my dad has to sort of drive up in the car behind um so there's obviously a chance that he's going to get to the hospital later than us so it was really important for me to sort of see him before I left so I could give him a hug and say my goodbyes in case you know it was all going ahead hello everyone I'm just in the ambulance um on the way to Newcastle I've had my call for my new lungs I'm really really excited a little bit nervous I won't know until I've got to the hospital whether um, it's going ahead, but fingers crossed it is, and uh, I'll keep you posted. Um, and we got to the hospital for I think about half one, and was told that they were going to begin all the sort of pre-transplant tests. They did at that stage still warn me that they still didn't know if the lungs were good enough for transplant. The whole thing was just really surreal. Like it was like we were there, and it was like oh, it was really strange that in a hours or so it's time I could be going down to theatre to get new lungs um but then at quarter past three um the transplant coordinator came in and she said oh I'm really sorry she said I've got bad news she said the lungs aren't good enough um she said there's something wrong with the donor so obviously we were like really disappointed it's not so much relief that washes over you because you're not relieved because you wanted it to go ahead you've kind of just got to deal with the fact that it is a false alarm that wasn't my time you know i'll get my call at the right time and the right lungs will come along when they're supposed to come along It has been the biggest roller coaster of my life. Like the doctors said to me, they said, oh, we knew you were going to be a difficult case, but we never thought you were going to be this difficult. <laughs> I woke up at 11 a.m. Um, on the Wednesday morning. I was really annoyed <laughs> because like, I had this ventilator in my mouth and I wanted to talk because you can't talk with it. So yeah, they took it out. And then it was just like obviously taking my first breaths with my new lungs. Um, and it felt okay, but I had four chest strains in, which are really painful. I came down from intensive care to the transplant ward really quickly, um, like within 24 hours. And then for like 10 days, I was doing really well. Sort of on the 10th day post-transplant, I came down with like the most horrendous temperature and it just kept going up and up. And then eventually they put me on something called CPAP, which is like a really tight mask on your face and it like it's just like a constant stream of high pressure oxygen because I needed to go back up to intensive care because I was obviously starting to get to a critical stage I just can't explain how difficult it was to breathe like I honestly thought like I was gonna die I almost felt like I was gonna my lungs and my heart were gonna explode out of me um I had a huge huge infection um because when they took the old lungs out there'd been some spillage and that had reinfected my new lungs and they decided that the only sort of um, solution was to um, re-sedate me and ventilate me. I was like in not a good state, you know, like they were having meetings with my parents saying it could go either way, like there's a high chance that she's not going to survive. Um, so yeah, like my professor, Coris, had to make like a big decision. He decided to turn me prone, which basically meant like turn me from laying on my back to laying on my front. Um, I think I was prone for about two days and luckily then that was the turning point. After two weeks, they woke me up. And then like within a day of being back on the ward, um, I started to feel really unwell. Like I was in that much, I was so weak 
and I felt so horrendous that all I could do was just like nod and shake my head and um, they discovered that basically my kidney um, my kidneys were failing so I had to go back to ITU and um, to get treatment for my kidneys which was dialysis and then they decided that I was well enough to come back to the ward because on the ward you can still have intermittent dialysis. So as you can imagine, I was very nervous. It's amazing really how much progress I've made in sort of like the two weeks that I've now been down here. Like right now, I'm feeling really happy and positive and confident about things. The main difference to be fair is just that I don't cough. Like I can dress myself undress myself I can have a shower and just walk to and from the toilet and I don't cough so yeah it's made like it just a huge difference it's just a miracle really I tell you it's going to be hard but nothing can prepare you for how hard it can be and I mean what happened to me doesn't happen to everyone like I know some people that were discharged after two weeks I'm currently at like seven and a half weeks now I've been here so I reckon hopefully by nine weeks they'll let me home <laughs> So it was in 2013, in July, um, and Emma was really poorly. And then um, I went in to see her because obviously I knew things weren't great and that, you know, she wasn't going to survive. So I was allowed in to go and see her and sort of say my goodbyes. And I think seeing her and how difficult it was for her to breathe, and obviously she had tried to get a transplant and unfortunately just got too poorly and so she had had the strength and the courage to go go through all of that and everything and because I was promising to fight on for her that I then needed to um, do the same so it was about a week after she passed away um, I spoke to the doctors who I had initially told I didn't want a transplant, don't talk to me about a transplant and they referred me straight away so I asked if I could be referred to Newcastle really the first thing I wanted to do is like be able to talk to Emma and then also it was really strange because when I woke up from my transplant my mem like I was a bit woozy and fuzzy and um, I actually said I need to bring Emma and my mum and dad kind of looked at me and they were like, Holly, you do remember what happened to Emma? I got quite emotional and quite sad, obviously. I suppose in a lot of ways Emma has saved my life because without making my promise to her, I wouldn't have got this far. So I do feel like I, she knew I said goodbye and she definitely knew I made the promises to her that I did that I'd fight for us. Celebrate! Hi. There you go.